Welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to do a tips and tricks video for the Dune Imperium board game. I'm going to walk you through a pretty cool game mechanic that's present in Dune Imperium, and this kind of revolves around having either two or three of these agent meeples in the game. You start the game with two, and eventually you can earn a third one by purchasing the Swordmaster space. So what's kind of cool about this game is that you can either focus on having a lot of persuasion points, and the persuasion points are going to allow you to buy uh, larger, larger and more powerful cards, or what you can do is you can move to more spaces with the agent markers, now, alternatively, you could do both, but it's very, very expensive to do both. So kind of at the beginning of the game, I, I tell players and newer players to this game, maybe just focus on one and figure that out, get it going in the game, and maybe not focus on both. I think you can win the game with either having a really high persuasion value or having the third agent people. So to kind of illustrate this, uh, when you start the game, you're only going to start with two of these agent sort of meeples. And when I play a card, it's going to then allow me to go to that space, and then the meeple goes onto the board. And then consequently, I play a second meeple uh, with that card. But this only then allows me these three cards during the reveal phase. So in this case, I'm only going to have three of those persuasion points. And those points are what I'm going to use to buy new cards. Now, alternatively, if I return all of the cards sort of back onto the table, and we take a look at this, now let's say I have three of these um, Agent Meeples to play, and maybe I play this one, this one, and this one, and these all get eliminated and removed because I'm playing them. Now during my reveal phase, I can only have one Persuasion. So kind of what's cool about this game is that you can kind of balance between having Meeples that go out onto the board, and I get additional resources, I can play troops, things of that nature, or I can spend my Persuasion points to gain really hefty cards that really hit hard and they're very impactful. So these are two strategies that I want to kind of talk about. It's really the um, sort of Swordmaster icon space and the High Council space, and I'll walk into uh, how those work in just a second. One quick note I want to make about this game before I move on to the High Council and the Swordmaster space is that at any point in time, whether I have two or three of the agent meeples in the game, I have the ability to do my reveal phase. So let's say there's a really excellent card out on the table. I can completely omit placing my workers, my uh, agent meeples onto the board for that turn to just simply reveal my hand. So in this case, I would have one, two, three, four, five persuasion points to spend on a pretty nice and expensive card. Any card that's kind of like five or higher, that, that's a really good card and it's gonna give you a lot of good uh, sort of special effects when you do that. So just always keep that in mind, no matter how many meeples you have, you can always just stop at any point in time and say, hey, I'm going to reveal. And that's a great strategy as well. One of the reasons I tell new players to just focus on either the High Council or the Swordmaster is the pretty high cost of purchasing these spaces. Please note that these are only uh, active once per game. So once you purchase this tile, you can only purchase it once per game. Same thing with the Swordmaster as well. Now, five and eight Solari, that's going to take you a while to build that up. So that's that's kind of a, a high achievement to get that amount of money and to play that down. So for the High Council, I'm going to always have two additional persuasion points per turn when I'm purchasing cards, and that's absolutely fantastic. Or alternatively, once I purchase the Swordmaster space, this meeple comes off and I can start using it to place it down onto the board. Now, the total cost of those combined, if you want to do both, is 13 Solari, and that's something you can't really do near the early point of the game. You could definitely do it toward the mid to late game, which is fine, but I always kind of tell players, just focus on one or the other. If you want really high, powerful, impactful cards, go ahead and go for the High Council. If you want to place down meeples onto the table, if you really enjoy that, um, I would recommend then going with the Swordmaster. 
Here's a quick summary of how these strategies work in the game. So I went ahead and just pasted the board spaces into this slide so we can take a look at it. And this will give you a basic roadmap on what to look for when the game first starts. So first and foremost, you have the wealth and the secure contract spaces. These are great and pretty easy ways to gain Solari pretty quick in the game. And you can do a, a quick combo. Even on your first turn, I've been able to get this to work several times. You play um, one of the Emperor faction point cards down. You take the wealth space and then you can play a secure contract card as well. And that'll net you five Solari in the first turn. Then on the next turn, if you hit the secure contract space again, that gives you your eight Solari that you need for the Swordmaster. So very quickly, you can do a wealth and secure contract to get you enough Solari for the High Council. And you can buy that on the second turn. Um, alternatively, you can do these three steps in a row. It's a little bit harder because these are highly contested spaces. But then you can purchase that Swordmaster pretty quickly in the game. Now, a little bit more subtle strategy, and I don't see as many people doing this. So on your first opening turn, if you have a Fremen faction card, go ahead and purchase the Still Suits. That's going to give you one water resource. Now, you're going to start the game with a water resource anyway. Then on your second Meeple placement, go ahead and hit the Great Flats. That's going to net you three spice. You're going to have to burn both of your waters. But then you have three spice. Then on your next turn, you can sell either two or three of those spice for six or eight Solari. And that gives you the opportunity to purchase either the High Council or the Swordmaster. So this is a very quick and efficient way to get one of your um, really important aspects of the game going, either the High Council for influence or the Swordmaster for that extra agent meeple. Another really fun game mechanic are the intrigue cards that are present in Dune Imperium. There are several spaces on the board and there are several ways that you can gain intrigue cards. Now, when you look at the overall stacks of intrigue cards, the vast majority of these cards are going to be the plot cards. These are played in general when you place one of your agents onto the board. You can also play a plot as well. There are a fair number of the combat cards, and these are a great way to surprise your opponent in a battle. Let's say you both have you know, pretty much equal forces in the combat phase. You can throw, you know, one or two of these out to overcome your opponent and sort of beat them at the last minute. And then there's only really a few of the end game cards, which some of these are fairly situational. One of them, you have to have two spice must flow cards in order to cash these in, um, things like that. So really what you're looking for in intrigue is to enhance uh, first and foremost, when you're placing your agents on the board, you get all sorts of different special abilities. Uh, you can get extra resources. You can get victory points by spending Solari. Uh, you can get faction points by spending Solari, things of that nature. And then secondarily, you're going to surprise your enemy in combat by putting out, you know, a host of these combat abilities as well. So you can kind of tip the scale in your favor. So one of the strategies, look for the open intrigue card slots on the table when you're placing your agents. It seems to work a little bit better if you have the Swordmaster um, extra agent earlier on in the game. It seems like you can spend that extra agent every turn gaining one of those intrigue card spaces and you don't have to worry about it hurting your engine altogether. So. Think of it that way, is that you can enhance your agents by getting these entry cards. If you have more agents that you can spend on the table, it gives you more flexibility and versatility. So I'll show you kind of what those look like and sort of the investment schemes and what you get out of those. Let's go ahead and walk through the intrigue spaces on the board. The first one is Conspire. This one's a little bit more difficult to get. You have to basically spend four spice and uh, you have to have one of the Imperial faction cards to actually even get to this space. It's a great space. This is more combat oriented. Um, and it's something you should do probably more in tune with a combat strategy. Next is Carthag. This one is extremely easy to get. All you have to do is spend one of the uh, purple circle cards to get onto this space. It gives you a troop, it gives you an entry card, and the ability to add Troop Streamer Garrison into the combat. And then probably my favorite one is Secrets. It's in the Bene Gesserit sort of faction tree on the side of the board. This one you can spend... Uh, just that Bene Gesserit faction card to land on it. And when you do, you get an intrigue card. 
But the great thing is you get to steal entry cards from all the other players that have more than three entry cards. So if they have four more, you can steal an entry card from them, and you can steal from every single player on the board. So be really, uh, be really mindful of that, especially toward later in the game. If you take an entry card from somebody plus you get one, that means you're basically netting two entry cards, and you're kind of hurting your opponent at the same time. So this is definitely a great option for you to look out for. Card drawing in Dude Imperium can also be another fantastic strategy. So there's several spaces on the board I want to show you really quick. Uh, one of them is Selective Breeding. Next we have the Mentat space, uh, followed by Arakeen, and then finally the Research Station. The Research Station is surprisingly powerful. It is a little bit hefty to purchase that space. It will cost you two water, but you do get to draw three cards. So any of the spaces on the board or any of the cards in your hand that allow you to draw extra cards allows you to have more versatility on your agent placement. In addition, when you have a reveal action, it's going to increase the amount of persuasion points you can spend to purchase cards. As an example, let's say we're toward the end of our turn. I have two convincing arguments on the table. I go ahead and, uh, let's say, I purchase the research station. That's going to net me three cards. So if I do my reveal after that point in time, I can jump from a mere four persuasion points all the way up to ten persuasion points. And that's a fantastic way, and I know this, this is a little bit of a simplified uh, sort of scenario here, but it, it increases your buying power for persuasion. So now you can move into purchasing some of those larger cards, uh, you know, some of the eight point cards. You can buy a Spice Must Flow card, which will net you one victory point. So that's a fantastic option as well. So always think about what you can do with card drawing. Now, if you are gonna draw cards and you have your three agents, I would suggest getting the cards earlier on in the turn. It's gonna allow you more flexibility on the locations that you can go to. And then toward the end of the turn, if you're trying to, let's say, net a Spice Must Flow card, you know, you can make that push, you can get those extra cards. In addition to this, don't also rule out that combat icons can be present as well. And obviously you're gonna have you know some better combat cards toward the later part of the game, but you can also add these points to your conflict totals. And if you have several of these cards, they can pile up and add up really quick. Here's another example. During your uh, reveal action, you can get a persuasion and a combat icon. So think about all of these things. Think about making your reveal action really strong and card drawing will definitely help you with that. Conflict is good in Dune Imperium. It is a great way for you to net victory points and other resources. We're going to just do a quick overview. This is the active conflict card. This is telling you what you're fighting for during that combat round. So in this case, you're going to be fighting for victory points and you can potentially gain some spice. The next term we're going to look at is garrison. So the circles that are surrounding the center of the conflict, this is the garrison. These are troops that are not actively engaged in the conflict. In the center of the board where you see these cross swords, these are all of the troops that have been dedicated to the combat. These are the ones that are going to be actively fighting for this card at the end of the turn. Now notice everything in the middle will get removed from the board after the combat is completed. Your garrison troops will remain through the uh, next turn and you can spend them on the next turn or subsequent turns. Uh, we have a combat tracker at the bottom and this is a really quick and easy way to tabulate all of your combat bonuses at the end of the turn. And notice that each troop is worth two points and each of these sword icons is worth one. Conflicts in Dune are extremely important for progressing your victory point totals. I kind of just threw a bunch of cards onto the table. These are conflict cards. And you can see that in general, there are a lot of victory points that are present on these cards. You really have to be mindful that when these conflicts open up at the beginning of the turn, if you have a decent number of troops, start using them immediately to take um, you know, some of those spaces. So place your agent meeples on spaces of the board that will allow you to place your troops into the center of the conflict. You don't want to miss out, especially on a lot of these double ones where you get two victory points. Those can make the difference between winning and losing. And throughout the course of the game, you can see that there's quite a few of even the single point ones. And then also, too, a lot of the second tier rewards, even if you don't win the conflict, those are pretty decent as well. Um, there is a lot of spice 
that is present on a lot of these conflict cards. Spice in general, in my opinion, is one of the best ways that you can gain troops. So I'll kind of go through these loops and these arcs on how you can spend spice to build troops and then the troops move into the conflict and then you use those troops to gain more victory points and additionally more spice and it's almost this endless loop and this rhythm that you can get into and it's kind of cool so i'll walk you through what some of those strategy loops look like and once you get some of these going you can sustain them for many turns and build sort of some long-term strategies over two or three turn sort of blocks and you can execute some of these loops like two or three times during the course of the game and it really helps your your point totals and it also helps you lock down and shut down a lot of the enemy troops on the table which is fantastic as well next i'm going to teach you how to build up a lot of troops and i'm going to call these battle loops and as you can see once you get these going you're going to do the same thing over and over again once you have the system primed and you can execute these moves anywhere from two to three times in a uh, 10 round game which is a pretty typical game so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to focus on ensuring that we can generate water effectively and easily and the first thing that we can do is we can go to the Fremen sort of uh, location and get the still suits that will generate one water. But what happens in this game is that still suits gets contested fairly often when you play Dune Imperium. So you need a, a secondary or a backup way to gain water. And since this is a battle loop, another great uh, portion of the board you can go to is Siege Tabor, which gives you a troop. And there's a conflict icon on it, which allows you to move troops from your garrison into the conflict, and it generates water. So the first step is that we need to unlock Siege Tabor, and in order to do that, you need two Fremen influence. So the only ways that you can get uh, Fremen influence, or the, the typical ways, through the board are the Still Suits location and the Hardy Warriors location. So if you're going to do this sort of battle loop you need two of these influence so if you want you can do still suits twice you can do still suits once and then hardy warriors or any combination of the two that's going to unlock those two water um, locations both still suits and siege tabor and you're going to use the water then to start harvesting spice so on the second row of this slide you have the great flat haga basin and the imperial basin both the great flat and the haga basin you need water to harvest spice the imperial basin you do not but it doesn't yield as much spice so next the next goal and the next stage of this progression is for you to build up four or six spice now if you've watched the earlier part of this video um, one of the strategies is using spice and sort of water production to prime your engine to get the extra agent you can actually use that strategy and then roll directly into combat so that's a really cool progression you get your extra agent and then you can roll directly uh, into this combat loop so the whole objective of this first loop is to obtain four or six spice now i'm going to show you where you're going to be spending those four or six spice and sort of the loops that you can go through once you have that here is the first loop that we're going to talk about and it focuses on raising your faction with the emperor uh, so this one is only going to consume four of the spice that we talked about so first step you have your four spice play an imperial faction card and take the conspire space it's going to net you five solari two troops and one intrigue card that is a hefty amount of stuff that you're getting for that four spice next now that you have five solari you can spend solari to rally troops so you can take that space and spend um, four of the five Solari that you just gained. Now you're going to have six troops that are sitting in your garrison, at least six troops. You might have some more. Now you need to get those troops onto the table. So what we're going to do is we're going to pick spaces that will let us do this loop again. So be on the lookout for a couple different things. Be looking for water spaces. So the still suit space and siege Tabor. If you place a Agent Meeple on either of these, these are both conflict marker tiles, which allows you to take troops from your garrison and put them into the conflict. So that's fantastic. Also, Siege Tabor will give you an additional troop. So really, if you go through this loop, you can net seven troops really easily. 
and you're going to net a water and then potentially net another water with the still suits. So this strategy works very well if you have three agent meeples. Next step is once you've built up some water, you have some troops out on the table, you can start harvesting spice again. The great thing about this strategy is that once you start harvesting the spice, all of those locations for spice harvesting are also conflict oriented, which means that you can take troops from your garrison and put them directly into the conflict. So by doing this, we're gonna be building up spice and then moving our troops out of the garrison into the conflict, and we're gonna be winning those conflicts and gaining those victory points. Once we have all of the spice built up, the cycle can start again. And we can do either this, loot or we can do the Spacing Guild loop, which is what I'm about to show you. The next strategy that we're going to focus on is the Spice Battle loop for the Spacing Guild. And this one, I think, is probably my favorite out of the two. This one is super easy to execute, and it's pretty powerful. This loop is going to require that you have six Spice. So the first thing that you're going to do is purchase the Highliner spacing guild faction location on the map and it's going to net you five troops and what's great about this since it's a conflict space all five of those troops can either be placed into your garrison or directly into the conflict so this is a great way to dump troops immediately into the conflict the other very very cool thing about this it's going to net you two water now as we've been talking about these spice battle loops in order to get spice harvesting, I'm going to need water, and this thing nets you two water. So that's fantastic. Now I can play uh, Still Suits or Siege Tabor again to increase my troop count even further and get water. Then I now have potentially even more water that I can use for spice harvesting. What I like about this one a little bit better it gives you a jump it gives you a boost in water resources so you can go directly into spice harvesting next i'm going to focus on getting either four or six spice if i get four spice i can go back to the emperor spice loop or if i get six i can go directly back into the highliner uh, spice loop as well what's great about this you can get spacing guild faction which can gain you victory points and then also you're going to be really hitting the conflicts hard with this strategy and you're going to be winning those conflicts and gaining additional victory points in that manner as well. Here is a deck building strategy for Dune Imperium. This one is called faction loading and you can perform it using either two or three of the agent meeples. I think it works relatively well with both. Uh, so first and foremost what we're going to focus on is buying really cheap cards. These, these are going to have low persuasion costs, anywhere from the 2 to 3 range, and you can see all of these on the table. And each and every one of them has at least one uh, faction that you can use to get onto the board and start increasing your victory points through faction as well. So the first thing that I want to note is that each and every one of these factions has a sort of cheap uh, faction card and you don't need to actually pay anything to land on those spaces so when you start spending them you're not going to be consuming any resources now each faction also has one in which you have to spend something so in this case you have to spend a water so be really careful and mindful that when you're playing this strategy I suggest always trying to take the spots and locations in which it doesn't really cost you anything and this is going to do something interesting in the game, especially if you have a bunch of these cards and you're playing down roughly two of your agent meeples every turn, taking these cheap faction locations, you're crowding out your opponents. Your opponents will not be able to sit on these locations because you've already taken them, essentially. So you're robbing them of those influence points and you're essentially kind of forcing them to go to other locations on on the board and on the map, so to speak. Since this is a worker placement game, you're gonna mix a strategy of deck building and you're gonna crowd them out using um, sort of those worker placement strategies as well. So this is a great way to blend this together. So think of it as you're starving them of influence and you're gaining those influence points. So if you look at this tracker, you can net two victory points from each one of the factions. Now, obviously these uh, are not competitive, but when you hit, let's say, an influence at this location, you can take the alliance marker itself. Now, if your opponent goes past you and influence, they can take it from you. You're going to lose a victory point. They're going to gain one. But by doing this strategy, you're constantly going to be putting 
um, out influence points onto the table. So you're going to be leading the pack and you're going to get a lot of these markers. By using this strategy, it's not uncommon to have two, three, I've even seen four alliance markers, uh, players that have literally every single alliance marker when they're using the strategy. So that's pretty fantastic. If you think you only need 10 victory points roughly um, to kick the game into the end game, um, you can get eight just on this track. Now four of these are gonna be pretty easy to get and you can easily get two of the alliance markers I feel like with the strategy. So that's gonna net you a total of six victory points. So you're definitely gonna be competitive. And if you're looking out for other opportunities for victory points while you're playing this strategy, that's great as well. So think about trying this strategy out. And like I said, it works well with either two or three of your agent meebles. A deck building strategy that you can employ really goes around focusing on persuasion and purchasing really expensive cards for your deck. So this is a great deck building strategy. So the first thing that you want to do is that I would recommend for this scenario you only need two of your agent meeples and the reasoning behind that is that when you do your average reveal phase you're gonna have you know those three cards to reveal. So what you're looking for is to have more cards to do persuasion so you can purchase really expensive cards. So first and foremost you're going to need the high council space. Something else that can help you uh, with buying these expensive cards is the Hall of the Oratory which is located right here. It gives you one persuasion point for your next reveal action and then this uh, space right here, the High Council, we've talked about it before, it gives you two persuasion every time you do that reveal action. So if you want to buy something expensive, you can basically get those three extra points to buy some really heavy hitting stuff. So kind of on this row right here, I put out some of my favorite cards for this strategy. Now, when you're playing this way, don't buy cheapo cards because that's going to dilute your deck. You want to only focus on really heavy hitting cards so your deck is going to be concentrated with those heavy hitting cards. You're going to be getting them more often. Don't just buy cards for the sake of buying cards and don't ever feel like you have to spend all of your persuasion every turn. So in this case we can get some really heavy hitting cards. The Quisax Hatterack is probably the most powerful card in the game in my opinion. Pretty much any time you have that it helps you literally just win the game. It's, it's, really, it's really overpowered but there's only one of them in the game so that's okay. Opulence is great. You can essentially uh, spend Solari for victory points. I like these Worm Rider cards. I think there's several of them in the deck. The Sadakar Legions, those are fantastic as well. And, you know, things like Gurney Halleck. You're gaining a lot of stuff um, in the deck so that when you do your agent placement, you can get a lot of stuff. And then, alternatively, when you do your reveal action, you're going to get a lot of stuff as well. So, really going with high persuasion cards is fantastic. And then finally, I want to throw into the mix the Spice Must Flow. Now these cost 9, but if you are sort of loading your deck to generate tons of persuasion, 9 points, that's still going to be pretty hefty, but you can buy anywhere from 1 to 3 of these over the course of the game. And that's going to net you anywhere from 1 to 3 victory points, because you're going to get that victory point when you first purchase the card. So this is a great way to sort of supplement your victory point income. And then also too, since all of your cards are going to be so effective, you're going to be making some big moves every turn. So I highly recommend trying this strategy. It's very, very effective and very, very fun. I want to thank you for spending your time with me today. Hopefully this video has shown you some cool tips and tricks that you can use the next time you play Dune Imperium. Uh, once again, thanks for watching and as always, have fun gaming.